And my talk today is Dynamic Harmlessness for Today's World. And it might help to start out by telling you that I inherited millions. And if you pay attention today, I might share some of it with you. Because that little kid Clint that's running around, he doesn't need all of it. But first, I want to tell you something a little bit about Vance. Now Vance, despite being in our little skit showing you how people learn about veganism, he's actually a pretty impressive tour guide in the city of Philadelphia. <coughs> and he leads these tours, not of the Betsy Ross House, the Liberty Bell, Independence Hall, but he had me meet him in North Philadelphia in one of the rougher neighborhoods. The air was dusty. The day was so hot that if I dropped my carrot in the road, it would instantly be scorched on the pavement. We met at a special place. We went for a walk over a bridge above the railroad tracks where we peered through a fence. We read a smokestack together on a large brick building. And on my way to meet Vance, and as I was parking my car, I asked a man from the neighborhood if he knew anything about this historical landmark. And he didn't know about the most important place in Philadelphia. It's called Cross Brothers. You see, in 1957, there was a man, my father, H.J. Dinshaw, and he was 23. His younger brother was only 20. They had been raised as ethical as they thought their family could be. They were lacto-vegetarians. And when my father started to question his father about their upbringing, why they were drinking the milk of cows but not eating them, his father dared him to go to our slaughterhouse. And my father wrote about that day. So I'll share his words with you. He said, Upon emerging from that windowless house of horrors, I disposed of my blood-saturated shoes. I threw every stitch of clothing into the wash. I bathed profusely in an effort to remove the clinging fragrance of that charnel house. Even so, it seemed I could not rid my nostrils of the awful stench for weeks thereafter. Decades have passed since that melancholy day. But the repugnance of those sights and smells is still well etched in memory. While clothes and skin can be washed clean in time, what soaps can we use to cleanse the conscience? Which super fortified detergent shall we use to scrub the soul pure and clean? Jay made a vow that day. I will work every day until all the slaughterhouses are closed. So Jay founded the American Vegan Society in 1960. And vegan means basically to eat plants and not animals. But that's not really enough. To truly be vegan, it implies an understanding of ahimsa which is an old Sanskrit word that means non-harming. But if you go through life not harming, then maybe you're really not doing anything at all. And so he used a much more Americanized version of the word, and he promoted it as dynamic harmlessness, which means to do the least harm and the most good at the same time. And that is the true way to find happiness. 
So when Vance's favorite building in Philadelphia closed, my dad really had not succeeded yet in closing the slaughterhouses because it really just relocated to the Midwest, closer to where the cattle were being raised. And people still support the slaughterhouses every day with their dollars, the choices they make each day. <laughs> now that building, it was actually also famous because Joe Frazier, famous boxer, used to train there by beating up on the sides of cows. And he was strong enough to carry half a cow at a time through the building. Sylvester Stallone filmed part of Rocky in that same building. And when I talked about this with one of my rowing students, she said that her uncle used to work in that building. It was one of the best jobs you could get at the time. It was a wonderful, clean, kosher slaughterhouse. He was well paid for someone who only finished high school. And she used to dine on much of the meat that was brought home. But then, more recently, she's purchased 10 of my books, Powerful Vegan Messages, and she's sharing them with her book club. So she's not vegan yet, but she's interested, and she's learning, even though her childhood was based on sustenance from Cross Brothers. So I'm wondering if there are any vegans out in the audience. Are there a few of you today? Okay, good. I love hearing your stories because each and every one of you has an amazing journey and you'd like to tell us how you got to become vegan. But I don't have that story. You see, it was already decided for me. My father founded American Vegan Society and a few months later, my mom came, and she's been working here since she was 18, every day. So when I came along, I was really kind of like their third child. There was American Vegan Society, there was my brother, then there was me. And so it was kind of destiny that I was supposed to be vegan. And so really, I feel like I'm much more like those of you in the audience who are not vegan. Where you just kind of do what you've learned from your parents from the culture that you've been surrounded by. And for me, my hat really goes off to those of you who are not vegan, who show the courage to show up to a vegan garden party, who are sitting here open-minded and eager to learn something different. We usually do what we know until something challenges us to really think about our beliefs and to think about what is important to us. For me, although I was vegan all these years, there are really a few kind of defining moments in my life. And although I have a bunch of stories, I want to share with you one. When I was dared to write the book Dating Vegans, I had to become someone who would date non-vegans for the entire year. Which really wasn't that much of a stretch because I usually socialize with people who are not vegan and usually don't even know that I am. And so for Robert, and I'm allowed to talk about Robert because he signed a waiver, but he also added a little disclaimer to his waiver. He said, please mention to your audiences that I'm in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm still single. <laughs> okay, so now I can talk about him as much as I want. <laughs> On our very first date, I fell for Robert. I fell hard. I fell right down the steps at the coffee shop. <laughs> he saw how graceful I was, <laughs> and he asked me on a second date to go dancing. <laughs> Now he had also learned that I actually live in a small cabin in western New York, out in Nowheresville, where I could get away with wearing sweatpants every day if I want to. So he's a pretty bright guy, and he likes the theater, he likes to dress up, he loves fashion. He asked if he could look through my closet and pick out what I was to wear. 
Now, I don't normally let guys go into my closet, but I figured, what could it hurt? I'm sure he'd find something, <laughs> but no. I wound up going dancing in a lacy black number out of his closet. <laughs> and the next week, we went on our third date. We went to a secondhand store where I could try on a huge stack of clothes. He went up and down the racks and he was picking out all the things, putting them in the cart. All I had to do was try them on, say yes, no, maybe, I could handle that. And it was secondhand, so like how expensive was it going to be? I could try some stuff. And things were going really well until he noticed I neglected an item. It was a leather halter top. I said I'm vegan, you know that. There's no point in me trying this on. But his dejected look convinced me to put it on for just a few seconds. The multitude of metal, metal fasteners confused me. I required his assistance in adjusting. Then he turned me around to look in the mirror when I, when I did not recognize the slutty vixen looking back at me. <laughs> She had power, <laughs> adventure, beauty, it's all conveyed in the mirror. Oh, I like this look. <laughs> he said, you should get in touch with your inner dominatrix. <laughs> I looked at this shirt and I looked at the tag and it still had the new original tag on it even though it was in a second hand store. It said it was marked down to only $12. I could afford it. I'd look great in it. I'd get at least $12 worth of drinks wearing it in the first public minute wearing that. <laughs> yeah. And then my mind played a video of a cow hanging upside down. Her throat slit, blood pumping out in her last living moments. She had worn it before me, proudly, where it belonged. I concluded then that I could never wear somebody else's skin and expect a man to take me seriously in my own. Now my dad, he taught me that sometimes you leave people with their thoughts and sometimes you know they'll remember a story and they'll think about it later. And to lighten the mood, he would have something quick like, man, isn't it great that Edison invented the light bulb? Because otherwise we'd be watching TV by candlelight. <laughs> Yeah, my dad filled me with these things every day. But one of the things I remember the most was driving up to places such as New York City, where his preparation for a talk would be sitting in the car, and I would have a stack of index cards like this and a pen, and he would tell me all his thoughts. And I was about seven or eight, and I'm scribbling along in this car as we're bent down the road. And he'd take these cards and he'd put them in his pocket and he'd have them there if he ever needed them during his talk. But he didn't use them. He just had them there, knowing they were there if he ever needed them. And that's really how I treated the wisdom he shared with me all these years. That now it's time to take these cards out of my pocket and share them with all of you. So when we're writing the book Powerful Vegan Messages together, which was last year, and for those of you who know my father know that he passed away in 2000, which is cool because like I get the last word on everything now, <laughs> but um, I really didn't know him that well because I moved away when I was 17. So I had to enlist the help of over 50 of his friends to help me write the book and share stories. And one of the coolest stories that was shared was from Tom Regan. He's a famous animal rights activist. You can buy some of his books in our book room. 
And Tom shared that his first memory of my dad was at 1975, the World Vegetarian Congress in Maine. He said that Jay Dinshaw needed a large canvas on which to paint his picture of the world, as he saw it could be. You see, Jay knew that veganism was a great thing for the animals, but he needed to convince people it would always also be good for the environment and for the rest of humanity. So he created the funeral for famine, complete with speakers, flowers, purses. It was set in a stadium. Thousands of people were invited in person to attend, and millions more were invited to watch on national TV. And his big canvas got them thinking. And he gave us all a lot to think about. And so what would you paint on a canvas today? Have we gotten any closer to having a funeral for famine? Have we gotten any closer to having a safe place for animals to live? Has the environment gotten any better? I know another famous painter. Well, he's famous in our household anyway. His name is Clint. <laughs> Now, Clint, I've asked him, why are you vegan? Because, see, he's four, but he's vegan by choice. And I've taken him to animal sanctuaries, where he's petted pigs and hugged cows and watched chickens run around. And when I asked him, why are we vegan? He said, because the animals don't want us to eat them. They want to do fun things. If we eat them, they'll be dead. And then they can't do fun things. <laughs> so it's really that simple. I take him to veg fests, like the one in Philadelphia that's coming up soon. We went there last year. And a girl came to me and she said, because I was tabling for American Vegan Society, so it was obvious I was probably vegan. She came up to me and she said, hey, you guys are down near Malaga. Yeah, I'm going to be in Newfield, next town over. I'm moving down there. I'm going to the country. I can't wait. I want to start my humane egg farm. I said, oh, that's terrific. Tell me about it. And I'm going to talk for a while. And then I said, so I've never had a humane egg farm. Don't know much about chickens. Who lays the eggs? The males or the females? Oh. <laughs> and she said, well, the females do, of course. I said, oh, good. So uh, what happens to the males? And she didn't know. So I asked if she wanted to know. <laughs> and now she's vegan. Oh. There's no humane air form. <laughs> <laughs> thing for milk as well. If you think about it, how do they get milk? And what happens to the boy calves? And that is only part of the story. But what happens when the females get a little too old to be productive? At what age do they go to slaughter? My father witnessed that. He witnessed the slaughter at crossbows. He was inspired to have a life promoting dynamic harmlessness, to do the least amount of harm and the most good at the same time. If you ever wish to have a mentor, a friend, a resource, if you didn't have the opportunity to meet Jay Dinshaw, I want to share him with you. See, many credit him as being the founder of the modern vegan movement in this country, kind of the father of that. But for him, he was just Jay. He was just the average American. 
he didn't really want you to know who he was. He just wanted to be another guy in the crowd. And I really believe that he is still out there in the crowd. His powerful vegan message is in each of us. It's ready to be awakened with dynamic harmlessness. And whether you originally came to learn about veganism for health and you're looking for more information and you might be going to wonderful websites like nutritionfacts.org and reading books like The China Study or you may have come for environmental reasons because 51% of the greenhouse gases are from animal agriculture and maybe you're checking out chompingclimatechange.org or maybe you're reading all the wonderful articles in American Vegan Magazine that our environmental editor Dale Lukenbeal supplies to us. Or maybe you come to be a member of the American Vegan Society for information about all these types of reasons why people become vegan. But if you truly want to grasp the ethical reasons, and you want to stay vegan, all you need to do is look inside yourself and think about what you truly stand for each and every day with what's on your plate, what you purchase with your dollars, what you decide to wear. And I want to share with you now my favorite quote from my father. This is from his chapter called Wisdom and Compassion. He said, to understand the feelings and thoughts of another, we need compassion. To adequately assess another's circumstances and be motivated to render meaningful assistance, we should attempt to walk in the shoes, hooves, paws, or fins of another, to see things from another angle and viewpoint. We have a lot of walking to do. It can be overwhelming at times. So Jay said, I can only do what I can do, but I can do it every day. He not only told me vegan stories, but he told me stories that would help me through other aspects of life. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Titanic. But how many know the story of the Carpathia? You see, in that ocean there was another ship. And when that ship got some weak distress signal, the ship's captain turned off all the hot water to his passengers. And he diverted all the steam to the ship's engines so he could go full speed ahead for four hours and pick up 705 passengers who otherwise could have drowned in the freezing cold North Atlantic. And the next time that you have a shower or something else that might be a little uncomfortable, your shower is a little cold, you'll remember this story. And you'll think to yourself, what have I accomplished today? Or what, I w what will I accomplish today? depending on which end of the day you take your shower. And you'll think about it. You see, some people go through life helping others and doing dynamic harmlessness. And some people are just rearranging the deck chairs. My favorite way to fix the leak in the sinking ship that we call the world is to invite people to dinner parties. Usually I'm the only vegan they know. And I disarm them by asking them what their three favorite vegetables are. And I design a complete meal with whole grains and legumes and fruits and vegetables. And they have a wonderful time. And they're not so fearful because I've taken an interest in what their vegetables are that they will enjoy. Originally, when I went to college, I wanted to be a civil engineer. But now I've learned that the bridges I want to build are really the ones that connect with other people. 
through vegan cuisine. And so when you feel like you're in a little bit of darkness or you're worried about the animals, just remember that Ahimsa lights the way. And remember dynamic harmlessness because we live in an imperfect world. It's impossible to be 100% vegan. And a lot of people worry about the minutia instead of getting on with the big task. See, I don't fault the people who drove here who didn't realize that there was something from animals in the tires of their car or anything else along those lines. I don't fault the people who go to a relative's house and eat something that they were told was vegan, but then they noticed something in it that wasn't quite, and they ate it anyway, just to not hurt someone's feelings. I believe that we're 99% vegan is the best we can be. But we can make good decisions 100% of the time with all the information that we're given. And so now I ask you to close your eyes just for a couple minutes. I want you to imagine 30 years from now, you're all very healthy, vibrant people. You're hanging out in your favorite place, whether it's a nice peaceful meadow or by a lake or maybe you're a city dweller, wherever that place may be, and a child comes up to you, and she asks you how old you are. Do you give her the answer? She says, wow, that's old. You were alive in the scary time. When the world was hot, the seas were rising, People were sick. The animals were in cages. Species were going extinct. What did you do? And you give her the answer. Now you may not know that answer right now, but I ask you to open your eyes. Go ahead and open your eyes. Open your eyes to a world of possibility through dynamic harmlessness. Think about your best talents, your favorite activities. We can change the culture of America. I want to thank Ray Sakura for giving me that story. It's in the book, one of the concluding chapters of Powerful Vegan Messages. Because like her, I truly believe that the culture is changing. Think how quickly people adapted to using cell phones and how few young people today even know what a landline is. I invite you to become a member of American Vegan Society and help celebrate events with us and help create new things. We have Vegan Cuisine Month in February, but we have events all year. We have the Vegan Generation 3 campaign, which gives you lots of ideas of how to get started along the vegan path. Or for those of you who are already vegan, it gives you lots of ideas of how to welcome others. Perhaps you'll mark your calendar for November 2nd, Dynamic Harmlessness Day. Or perhaps you'll celebrate Dynamic Harmlessness <coughs> every day. Maybe you'll volunteer to work with American Vegan Society in the future. There are lots of options every day. And so now you may recall how I started this talk. You're wondering about those millions. Oh yeah. My dad, he left me millions. Millions of reasons to do good in the world. And not a single penny. <laughs> but most importantly, I want all of you to remember that just like you, the animals want to do fun.
Thanks. <laughs>